Okay, we're back. We're live. It's 10 o'clock in the morning on a given Monday. And this is the middle way, very important show every single, well, every other Monday morning uh, with Chang Wang. He sets it up. He's a, a contributor to this program. And today we have Martin Hidman. And Chang is now going to um, give us an introduction of Martin Hidman. And also, he's going to talk about the scope of the show. Ready, Chang? Yes. Good morning, Jay. Good morning, Martin. Thank you so much. And uh, to be on the show back again. Appreciate Martin have the uh, take time to be on the show. Today's topic is going to be automation, and our expert is Martin Hedman. Martin is a fine gentleman from London, <laughs> and he received his bachelor and master degree from the higher education institutions from the UK. I'm going to just uh, spend uh, 30 seconds uh, to read his official bio. bio. Uh, Martin has been working on the overlap between product and technology in the professional information industry for over 30 years. During this time, he has held senior roles in product strategy, research, design, and the development. He has significant experience working with development teams within waterfall, agile, and hybrid processes. His current area of focus and expertise is defining the value that automation and AI can bring to data-driven organization and the developing business cases that support investment in this fast moving and exciting industry. Now, please allow me to uh, share his unofficial bio. His unofficial bio is Martin uh, happened to be my first supervisor in corporate America. And he taught me so much, how to, particularly how to survive and function in corporate America. And uh, there are so many things I learned from Martin. But in our previous organization, we were three types of people. There were business people, a lot of them. There were technology people, a lot of them. And there is marketing. The marketing is a bridge between the business people and the technology people. And he's my role model because that's exactly what I try to do. I try to be a bridge between the American people and the Chinese people. And I found translation it's the most difficult part because translation involves everything. It's cultural translation, it's not the Google translation. And Martin is a master of translate, translation. He translates technology term into business people could understand and then translate business jargon into the words and the phrases that technology people could understand. So we are very fortunate to have Martin today to share with us, his thoughts on uh, automation. Back to you, Dave. Mm, I can hardly wait. I really believe in what you're doing and, and the whole concept that uh, Chang described, Martin. Uh, so can you talk to me about uh, how you got involved in this? Something must have triggered your interest. What was it? Um, thanks uh, um, for your comments earlier, comments, Chung. Um, too kind. Um, so uh, to answer Jay's question, um, I think I had a very early brush with automation when I was 19, 20. It was my first nine to five job um, after high school. And I worked as a data analyst for a syndicate, a reinsurance syndicate of the Lloyds of London. They had just implemented a mainframe IBM system. And my job was to read the reinsurance contracts and extract um, seminal pieces of information from those contracts, put them into a structured database so other reinsurance agents and brokers could find it on the ma mainframe computer. And I used to think as a 19 year old, it's kind of interesting what they're asking me to do, which is essentially look for pieces of information and then t uh, write it out on this green, green sort of um, uh, grids in, with a biro, a black biro for a data entry person to then type it into the IBM uh, mainframe. And I just thought, what a waste of time, um, how much a duplication of effort. So as a 19 year old, I always had this appreciation for uh, efficiency around data. And then when I joined uh, Volta's Kluwer publishing company a couple of years later, then Reed, Else Reed Elsevier and then Thomson Reuters, all publishing companies, so much duplication of effort. And so I, I grew increasingly frustrated with all of the human driven decisions around data which were getting in each other's way and then to fast forward 30 years 
um, I found I got access to a new wave of automation tools which allow uh, those subject matter experts who understand the business process rather than relying on data analysts, data scientists to take control of some of those inefficient processes and really sort them out, really define the process, bring these automation tools in and um, get rid of all these middlemen in the middle um, functions which were causing delay, inaccuracies, um, uh, additional costs. So that essentially that's my, my arc um, into automation. Uh, when, when I was practicing law, we had one partner in the firm um, who was wild about uh, summarizing deposition transcripts. And uh, he would recruit a, a young associate in the firm uh, to read the transcript and then dictate what was in the transcript in a memo. Okay, and it took it took this associate all day long to read the transcript, and it came out in a memo, which in turn had to be read. So you had you know several people involved in a transaction that is accomplished now, instantly, um, mm -hmm. by searching for keywords. Right, um, and uh, you know it was it was extraordinary. This is not that many years ago. Yeah. And I guess my reaction is, um, you can say that, Martin, but but the world is still way behind. It is. There are still and, lawyers out there that are well, asking associates to summarize, you know, thousand page transcripts. Yeah. Now, um, don't forget the importance of context. So uh, as Chung uh, co correctly um, defined earlier, you need to view information through a particular lens. Um, there is translation, not just um you know english language translation but business context translation as you're reading these documents and turning them into the next form of document which needs to be consumed by the next subject matter expert in the in the line of command or the the process so business context is it's very early in the day of automation for understanding quickly or quickly enough the business context which needs to be uh, pinned down as you start to abstract or extract that data and then pass it along. And it's very early in the days of automation uh, for the machines to really understand the business context. So um, humans are gonna be needed uh, for this translation work for quite some time to come, I believe. Oh my goodness, I, there I was thinking that humans would be unnecessary. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so why don't you do your slideshow, Martin? I know you have some graphics and maybe you could explain them to us. Yeah, so I think, you know, you, you're obviously the host, uh, Jay, but I do have a particular point of view uh, of where automation is. And I want to point to some of the early, early players um, through, uh, through, you know, I'll tell a few stories. Um, so if you could pull up the first slide, uh, I'll just give um, a summary of my last six or seven years. So I, I am a consultant. I, I work with um, Dow, the very largest Dow companies, uh, top 30, and also federal agencies. And so when they, when they, are, when they um, parachute me in, so to speak, they're having a lot of trouble making progress with automation. And um, my role is normally uh, an architect. I'm a solution design architect, but I'm also a program manager. So I interact directly with the business or the stakeholder for the project. And these tend to be multi-million dollar projects um, broken into various you know, platforms and data um, components, but the automation has to sit on top of all of it. And so the first question I ask is, what's your goal? You know, what is the, you know, if I could bring you automation in the first 12 months, what is it that you're looking uh, to achieve? And as a former product developer, I, I can go along with somebody who would say to me, we're trying to reimagine our entire business model. I would love that to be the response, but very rarely do they say that. What they say is we're looking to save costs. We have 30 people doing this one task. We would like to reduce it by a number of five. And we think automation can do that. So that slide I've just shown you is really at the far left. It's very tactical and it's very um, piecemeal. They have found a process which takes 30 people to do and they want to reduce that 30 people down to 25, but they have no interest in going either upstream or downstream to connect with other people who may be doing parallel type of work. 
Um, and this is, these are very large companies. It's not that they don't have the imagination, but the way that they are funding these projects, it's very, very tactical. Now, where I would like to go, or I, where, where I would like the um, industry to go, is to say, yes, those types of tactical projects need to be done, but strategically speaking, how does this organization want to change this business process to improve its services, to improve customer experience? And I'll come back to this point um, later. So that, so that slide is really just a summary of my work over the last five or six years. Um, and to your point, Jay, I think you made earlier that you feel it's very early on in the automation uh, uh, industry. And I completely agree with you. There's plenty of opportunity uh, to use automation in much more dynamic and more exciting ways. And I'll you know, come- in, yeah. in, our, in our real estate practice, we always say real estate is not about land. Real estate is about people. And, and I would say that automation is not so much about automation as it is about people. You know Absolutely. my meaning? Do you agree? Absolutely. I'm, I've got my last slide is on this. Um, so that, that's going to be a central theme through all these five slides. It's the combination of process because automation does need, you know, these are computers. They need to be told what to do. And the, and the, and the way you tell them what to do is to uh, first define your process and then codify your process. You've got to write it down and put it into the ones and zeros, which the computer or the platform that you're working with can make sense of. So that's the first, that's the first uh, part of the three-legged stool. The second one is data. Data has to be readable. It has to be consumable by the applications, by the platforms, uh, by applications, which the subject matter experts use to do their job. And the third part, what you're quite right, uh, Jay, is the people element. Are those people doing performing a creative, um, cognitive role? And if they are, how does automation or the processing of data support that cognitive, uh, you know, creative role? If that person is not doing a creative, cognitive role, are they doing something which is rules-based, repetitive, something which which a computer can do better than the human? then that's the kind of job that will be uh, eliminated or certainly avoided uh, through the use of automation. So when you have that conversation around the people element, you've got to be very clear, what is the subject matter expert trying to do? What's the support that the automation can provide? And ultimately, is there some change management here where the uh, split of menial repeatable tasks and creative tasks need to be rebalanced? You know, it's, um, <clears throat> I, there's another side to the people thing, and that's the resistance side. You know, I've been doing it this way for the past 20 years. Why should I do it differently? It works the way I've been doing it. Uh, don't tell me about new things. A good example is medical records, um, you know, automated medical records. Doctors don't like that. They don't like to do it. Uh, and that, 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 that leads off to the staff who don't like to do it. And the result is that uh, automated medical records have not made as much progress as we had hoped. And that is probably so in every capacity. I, I remember uh, it almost it almost got, it was political when the courts in Hawaii, starting with the lower court there, um, you know, were faced with automation of their um, you know records. Um, they opposed it. The clerks opposed it. The judges opposed it. Nobody wanted it, and it took much longer than it should have taken to get them to accept it. And I'm sure that's still the case, isn't it? That's the an other yeah. side of the people question. Mm -hmm. I th and I think there's a, uh, a multi-layered way of attacking automation. If you're an attorney uh, in the medical, uh, medical field or medical devices field, and you're, you're familiar with some of the compliance, uh, privacy, HIPAA, there's a lot of arguments for saying that an unattended bot that's going on a rampage in your uh, PII database is something you you can't even you, you know you can't go there. So and and I do come across this. What I what I tend to do just to you know as a kind of a rule of thumb is when I it's very easy to see somebody's role being reduced because they're doing menial tasks. So what I I do is take them to one side and I you know I've been doing this recently actually taking them to one side and giving them 
a career development opportunity to become what they call a bot line manager, a BLM. And it's, a, it's actually a term of reference to somebody who is the domain expert in the process, even if they're doing repeti re repetitive tasks, they still are the SME, the subject matter expert for the process. So there are plenty of uh, uh, job development opportunities for them to take ownership of not just a single bot, but a, um, and I'm using bot to uh, refer to a piece of software which understands the process and will perform those tasks, pulling in data, manipulating the data, and then mm -hmm. creating an output. So I'll be using bot a lot in this talk, but somebody has to manage the bot and it can't be somebody too high up in the organization. You actually have to know the process, you have to know the exceptions, the problems, technical issues. Um, and it's a great opportunity for somebody whose job is changing because they no longer uh, are employed to do those menial tasks to become a bot line manager. And it's, well, and it's multiple bots. What, what you said before the show was very interesting is that um, you, you, you had before <clears throat> you knew the technology, but not the business. Now, uh, to be efficient, you have to know the business. Yeah. And so you bring somebody in who knows the business and then you'll get a, a much better result. Well, somebody yeah. who's in the business, one of your, you know, your bot managers, um, they would by definition know the business. So what's missing with the bot manager is to know the bots. Yeah. And, uh, and so if you could train them to do both, then he or she would have a career outside that particular office, outside that particular process, because now it's a merger of those two factors within that person. It's very persuasive argument when you take them yep. aside. But let me I, ask I think, Chang, I, I want to yeah. ask Chang, Chang, is this something you've done in your office? Is this something you've seen done? Uh, is this something that you support um, or do you oppose it? And how about your staff? And why not have a small legal firm do all of this and, and have a benefit by it? Well, it depends on uh, the what type of law you practice. And I, I teach constitutional law and I practice art law and innovation law. So I work with artists and immigrants. And those people are hard to manage, honestly. And, and the, because, you know, I expect, you know, when the young people ask me whether or not you want to go to law school, my answer is it depends. And, and in most cases, uh, don't because most uh, legal practice areas will be automated and in the coming uh, years. But uh, uh, the three areas I'm most interested in, constitutional law, uh, art law, and, uh, uh, and immigration law, they, they require a tremendous human uh, involvement. In, in this case, I think that, correct me if I'm wrong, Martin, I think it's very difficult uh, to to be automated. And because you cannot, it's not like a mortgage application and for the immigration case and for the artist, you know, uh, uh, appraisal. And, and uh, so the, all of them involve human, tremendous human judgment, the FME, the subject matter expertise requires of decades of training and human interaction. But when, to both Martin and Jay, both you said about people, really interest me because I do want to throw this question back to you. And for the automation, what would be, because we hear these uh, comments all the time, the data is a new fuel. And, and because the, uh, the both automation and the AI, all of them require, you know, tremendous astronomical amount of data. And who has most amount of data? China and 20% of human beings are in China. And because of the, uh, the, uh, the pandemic, and they collected just an unbelievable amount of data. And people are so easy to, to be managed. If you ask you know, somebody in London and in, in, in Hawaii, OK, give me your uh, uh, footprints in the past 14 days so, so I can check whether or not you into an infected area, become a high risky you know, yeah. person. No so, American or British will be willing to do that, but right. Asian people said, okay, yeah, I know that is so what you've, 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 you've already made really um, five or six yeah. really important points, Chung. So can I, can I kind of step back and, 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 break, yeah. and break this apart? So the, the first point you made, which is um, really important, is um, 
you brought in the, uh, I'm just summarizing here, so the process of law. And the process of law, you know, is it's a moving, it's a moving target in its own right. Um, and the emergence of structured data, and when I mean structured, data that is controlled either from the courts or from uh, providers like Westlaw and Lexis, um, that data, as it grows, will um, will deliver insights and new ways of looking at the law which I think will impact the process of law. So whether that is looking at, at um, um, the, the structured uh, nature of case law, or it's looking at opinions, or it's looking at the results um, of litigation, that data is being amassed already um, by the major players, but also from the court system itself. Um, you know, these courts are starting to get on the bandwagon of structuring their data. And when they look at their data, it will bring insights and recommendations which may impact the actual process of law. So I, I think it's not a, I don't think the law itself is a fixed, a fixed object. It's going to be, in, it's going to be impacted by data. Now the, um, going on to but your that's, next... That goes, uh, I'm sorry for the digression, but that goes to everything. Yes. You know, this, this process you are describing throughout this discussion is iterative. Yes. You, you can't get in there and say, okay, we're going to automate it. This is the new world. That's it. And then so, wait and wait 20 years to change it. It's right. got to be iterative all the time. Right. Right. But where, where I don't agree with some of the commentators in uh, legal technology is that somehow AI is going to tell us what needs to change in the law or some of the practices of the law. I just, I don't believe that at all for a second. What I think will happen is um, some of the leading law firms or even the courts themselves will start codifying their own processes and it will be a combination of codified process and the data analytics or the data insights together, which will have the impact. I don't believe in these big sort of IBM Watson initiatives where they're just gonna suck all the data they can uh, from the US legal system and somehow uh, eradicate the need for lawyers. That, that is just not a, a future I, I see Agreed. that's feasible. Um, but there is work to be done, uh, both by the court system and by some of the, the larger law firms to clean up some of the practices um, and codify it. Co codify it. Now, whether they see it as a, as a strategic advantage, so one court system may invest in their own state-based uh, processes, or it may happen at the federal level, or you may get a, a major player, uh, you know, a, a large New York based firm who decides that it's going to be a strategic advantage for them to uh, create automated uh, legal services at the lower levels, going back to what uh, Chung was saying that the law is, you know, can be complex, needs interpretation, but some, some, some areas of the law don't. Um, so who's going to who's going to start automating those processes, and how will they describe the value around that automation? I you know I, I've been I found that website uh, for you, Jay, in terms of you know some of the emerging websites for helping individual consumers uh, push back on parking fines, for example. I mean it's not the law, but it's the it's the thin end end of the wedge. Um, I think there's plenty of opportunity to go up the the value curve for law firms to automate some of these processes ahead of, you know, ahead of where um, institutions are like, uh, you know, in, institutions within states or federal, maybe it, it, it becomes a commercial advantage first. So I, I think there's a lot of work needed to be done. Um, so if I was to put my uh, day job hat on, this is not a good use case for your automation. So um, this is something which I would push back on to say, you've got to be much clearer on what you think the positive outcomes of this word cloud or, you know, or whatever the solution is. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a crisply defined use case. So my role as an architect was to say, this is not a good uh, project. The other thing I'll just mention is that um, I, do, I do know a couple of, other than Chung, I know a couple of uh, talented lawyers who help me on these kind of conversations. Uh, Damien uh, Real from Fast Case and Laverne Pritchard, who's a, a local entrepreneur innovator in Minneapolis. 
And one of the first things I would do is go to those two guys and give them what Jay has just said and take their opinion. But from a technology point of view, this is not this is not a good discussion. Um, I would I would back away from this. Okay, I, I understood. And, and let me uh, let me add that uh, understood. But uh, we've agreed that this is all about change, including the architecture itself, including the technology, AI today. Who knows who knows what tomorrow? And who knows, uh, you know, what happens when you have a, a world of not of 7 billion, but of 10 or 12 billion, hopefully we get there. Um, and, you know, we may need greater efficiencies. We may need to, to plant this kind of um, automation you know, model everywhere yeah. in order to have society work. And so I, I say to you, can, can you envision the change within your own specialty? How is your specialty going to change going forward? So um, we probably don't have enough time to go through my slides, but I've got a couple of slides on examples of some of the players who are, are using automation to reimagine their business model. And that's what needs to happen in the law. Um, they need to take a step back. Uh, first of all, define the ecosystem of all the players, the data sources, what, what expe is expected to happen to the data, what are positive outputs, what are negative outputs. They need to do a, a full process discovery, process analysis um, view of the law. Very difficult to do, but, but not, not impossible. Um, so that's the first thing. From that view, the question I think you're asking, Jay, is how much change? How much change do you want? Do you want to go from zero to hero in 12 months, 12 years, 120 years? So I think the pace of change, um, there are a lot of supply chains in the legal industry. You don't, you know, you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater to, to, to use, a, use an expression. Um, so I think you have to be careful. Um, do the analysis, absolutely. Do it from a high level, all the players, all the supply chains, and then look at the pain points, what things aren't working, what could save costs, what could create new value. Uh, I've got a couple of slides on this. If you go to, I've got a couple. Um, so the, the Uber business model is a good one to start with. Um, so I, I became an Uber driver um, to really um, flesh out my own thoughts about the two personas in the Uber ecosystem. There is the uh, persona of driver, and then there is the persona of passenger. And I was convinced as a member of the general public that there must be something tying them together and there must be an automated ecosystem um, which has been put in place to improve the efficiency of essentially uh, being a taxi. Um, and that's exactly what I found, both as an Uber driver, a passenger, but also somebody who had contacts at Uber and I actually started asking some questions about the technology and absolutely um, they, have, they have started out with a business model which was defined very early on um, and the question was how are they going to use data to improve the management of safe driving and the service delivery um, to passengers but at the same time making sure they cost uh, cost out the drive in a competitive manner, or the journey, I should say, the cost out the journey. So, um, you know, this is what that, that Uber drawing from Tim O'Reilly is really what needs to happen in, in the law. Um, what are the, the main uh, components to a successful, uh, successfully run legal system? Um, and do a deep dive on all of those components. And, and of course, data is going to be the heart of it. But exactly what do you want to happen to the data? You know, is it structured? Is it unstructured? Um, do you need to pull information from other sources which you don't have access to now? Um, you know, you talk about public opinion. Well, public opinion is a very sort of fluid uh, type of data. But there are tools out there, sentiment analysis and other tools, which can give you more of a codified uh, view of what the public opinion is. Um, but are those tools used today in the legal system? Probably not, but should they? I don't know. That's a question for people, the stakeholders of the well, ecosystem. If you're selecting a jury, I think they would be very valuable. Maybe that, that's already the case. Right. So, so um, yeah, I mean, this is, this is really interesting. And uh, I wonder, I wonder where, where it all goes. It, to, to me, um, you know, the world is like a, a fellow, uh, he doesn't appear at the office. He's at home. He's by remote. He pushes a button, it starts to firm up. Uh, he goes plays golf. 
and there's nobody else works for the firm. Yeah, and, uh, I, the, and I don't. Highly... I don't. Yeah, I don't want that. I don't want that vision. I go so nuts. It, it, but no, that's 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 the ultimate. Okay, yeah. but we are we are on a path to get there. So I don't, my know. Question... I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm not sure. I I don't. I don't think. I think there are others like me who don't want to play golf. Uh, um, so, I mean, it's not, I, I, I'm not, nothing against golf. It's just that I, I get a huge amount of intellectual, uh, value from pursuing something which is on the edge, something on the edge of, of, you know, of changing the world as, as we see it. I love that. And I love these conversations, um, with yourself, Jay, with Chung and others. Um, would we have the same conversation at golf? Oh, fine, maybe I don't know, um, but no, I, th I think that there's. Um, I think humans have, and I've got actually. I do have a slide on this. Um, if you can go to my very last slide, I'm jumping ahead now, but it's a, it's a relevant point. So that relationship you talk about, we just press a button, the business runs itself. Um, I don't see that. I see uh, a new synergy between the human human creative spirit. And then those tasks, which really are beneath the human's um, uh, capability. So machines are good at th certain things. And it's not just turning a one to a zero, a zero to a one. There are patterns which can be created by machines, which a human has to interpret. But the imp all important lens to look through is context, right? That's a very difficult thing to codify. And so I think you'll have an emergence of a, of a new type of subject matter expert who expects there to be automation on their first day of the job. And the question is, how do I plug the right type of automation together into an ecosystem to get the positive results that I want either to provide to my customer, to provide a service? You know, so there's a, there's a lot of design thinking in building automation libraries and and putting those automation components together for a higher for a higher goal. And now, so speaking that's... of higher goals, we have a question from a viewer. <clears throat> and you know, as as the journalists at UH say, the most important news story of our lifetime is climate change. And the question from the viewer is, how can automation speed up solving the planet's enormous climate change problems. You're talking about business context, but there are other contexts, uh, larger in a way, you know, and more existential uh, than business, I think. Um, what's your answer to that? Um, my answer, I guess, is twofold. Um, first of all, climate change, I think, is a very difficult ecosystem to, def to define, a bit like the process of law, but it needs to be defined. I think there is, an, uh, there is a need for AI in climate change. Data can come in structured form and unstructured form, um, but there is also data which is difficult to quantify. And I think climate change is, is one of those areas where there's gonna have to be predictive modeling. And predictive modeling is something where you actually don't see something happening today, but through correlation of machine learning and statistical modeling, you can see it's gonna happen tomorrow. So I think it's a combination of, of science, policy, machine learning, modeling, um, which, which a government or you know, uh, an institution needs to get their arms around. And then speaking as a product manager, provide a brand so that the, the data from that model means something in the journalistic world. You know, I, I was listening to NPR today and we had, you know, there were extracts from the BBC, there were extracts from, uh, um, there was a US consultant, and there were others from uh, representatives from India, all quoting from their own sources, their own academic journals or their own data models. But there was no unifying brand which, which gave each of those sources any sort of hierarchy. They were all opinions, they're all based on science, but there was, it was, there was a lack of cohesion amongst all of the uh, protagonists that, um, for, for, for change to, to prevent uh, climatic disaster. So I think there's a huge opportunity for a unifying model which uh, plugs in uh, data analysis, gray literature, academic article, and makes, make something uh, out of it as a brand and use that brand uh, proactively to change policy. That's yeah. my own, that's my own two no, cents. No, I love it. I love it. And I think that's the future. 
and it's, it's building credibility. It's, uh, credibility. it's using tools to build credibility so anyone looking at it can get a handle on how valuable this source is. This is so important. This would be important in so many ways, in so many areas. But we're almost out of time, Chang. Can you can you do what you always do? Can you summarize and come up with the you know the fifty thousand foot uh, uh, takeaway on this? Oh my God, I will try. But I will <laughs> I will just uh, say this. You know, Martin has been my friend for fifteen years, and uh, uh, I learned two most important things from Martin. The first is life be a lifelong learner, and that I I I met very few people as intellectually curious as Martin. He always interested in new things and different subject area, different discipline. He always asked questions and learn from people from various backgrounds. And I really appreciate that, uh, 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 that intellectual curiosity. And I, I try to you know, uh, follow that model as well. And secondly, it be positive. You know, you, you probably heard that Minnesotans are uh, passive aggressive. I, I would call Marty, it's a pessimistic uh, optimist. <laughs> <laughs> so when there is a crisis, when there's a challenge, and he, he, thought he immediately realized this is uh, uh, that we are in a, a precarious situation, we are in a dangerous situation. But then quickly he analyzed, and he, he analyzed the situation, and he, he found solution. And, and, and he sees the opportunity. So that's why I call him a, a pessimistic uh, opportun opportun uh, I like opportunity. I like it. <laughs> so that's a, a few things I learned from Martin. And, and I'm really glad that we, uh, we are on this panel and to hear the expert opinion from Martin. And uh, we, ha we haven't finished everything we want to discuss today, but I very much look forward to our next conversation. And thank you, Jay and Martin. Yeah, yeah, thanks, thank Jane. you, Shang. Thank thanks, you, Martin. Jane. It's a very provocative discussion and lots to come. And we could sure. we could do this again and go much further, such as the issue of using technology for better or worse. We right. never got to that. Yeah, I'm right. sure you've thought about that. And uh, and, and and the private the privacy thing and persona is a definite uh, candidate for another session, um, a full 30 minutes on that for sure. Thank you, Martin. Martin Hinman and uh, Chang Wang. I, I hope you do set up on the session, Chang, and we'll be back. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. for having me. Oh, Thanks, Chang. Hi.